In 2021, his debut novel, The Girl, The Crow, The Writer, and The Fighter, was published by Into Books. Called, I quote, the finest American novel not to come out of America. The book was shortlisted for best debut at last year's Bloody Scotland Festival. George's second novel, Westerwick, will be published by Into Books this November. So let's get George onto the stage and give him a huge big Glasgow welcome, George. <laughs> Patterson. <laughs> I'm sorry, George Henderson couldn't make it. He sent me in his place. Uh, I'm truly honoured to have been invited here tonight to celebrate the launch of Gillian's debut novel, Brodie. And she couldn't have picked a better imprint in which to showcase her talents. Uh, but the talent itself is not enough. Uh, she have been in possession of that gift as a start, but without the courage and tenacity, you're not going to go too far. Thankfully, as you all know, Gillian Sheriffs has courage and tenacity and talent in abundance. James Baldwin once said that for him, writing was an act of love, and well, that may be the case for him. My own feeling is choosing to write fiction is more an act of madness than affection. A condition where one doesn't fight the voices in one's head, but actually encourages them. But still we do it, and still we love it. I haven't got my glasses tonight, so if uh, I pause dramatically, it's not to do with the story, it's because I can't read what I've written. Uh, like Brody, my debut novel, The Girl, The Crow, The Right and The Fighter, was published by Into Books, and I'm pleased to say it didn't put Stephen Cameron off teaming up with me one more time. Uh, my second novel, uh, Westerwick, is a psychosexual thriller with occult overtones set in 2018, on a fictitious Scottish island and here in Glasgow's West End. And I'm delighted to say that it'll be published by Into in November. The book tells the story of Thomas Levin, a young but troubled lawyer whose faith has deserted him. Handpicked to interrogate a serial killer, Angus John McMillan, Thomas finds himself drawn into the preternatural mind of the prisoner, something which not only makes him question his convictions, but his own sanity. And if you'd be so kind to indulge me, I'm going to read uh, set the scene with a couple of short pieces from the opening chapters. One summer, my mother allowed me to stay up late, but only until the sun set. As daylight hours were longer on the island, it was already past eleven when the last light had gone. On this one night, the temperature dropped suddenly, so she asked if I would go into the kitchen and close the outside door. By the pantry, at my feet, sat a slug. Dark green in colour, with yellowish markings, perfect for garden camouflage, less so for the checkboard linoleum, which covered our uneven hard stone floor. My grandfather had been doing some work that weekend and had left one of his tools on the sill by the door. I took it and slipping the blade beneath his body, I lifted the slug, carefully placing it back in the long grass. The following night, as I closed up, I noticed a trail from the door frame and one of the black squares the slug had returned. The same slug. Again, I used the tool to lift it. This time, I walked bare through, it, through the cold, damp grass to the far side of the garden. I put the slug down among the shrubs on the other side of the wall, safe in the knowledge while it was not welcome in our home, I wished it no harm. That night, however, while I slept, the slug returned. Through the kitchen, along the hall, and under my bedroom door, I heard it come onto the foot of my bed and onto my chest. Frozen with fear, I prayed. The slug raised its head and spoke. Your God cannot help you now. <laughs> what do you want of me, I asked. Evil lives in Westerwick and here it shall die. <laughs> A little bit more to go. <laughs> It's been said that Glasgow looks up to the West End, but the West End looks down on Glasgow. And from the summit of Partick Hill, the physical truth in that adage is undeniable. While the tight, steep wind to the north of the clubhouse twists to its apex, the straighter, more fearsome climb from the Dumbarton Road offers a long testing reward for all but the hardy. At its base, the flat, high-sided blocks around the once industrious banks of the Clyde not only provide shelter, from the winds which swirl up from the coast, but hides some of the city's more curious secrets. To its west, behind a barrier of corrugated rust, lies a cricket ground which conversely happened to be the birthplace of international football. 
If it wasn't for a minuscule plaque, a visitor might walk past contentedly, never knowing it was there. On its eastern side, just beyond the bustling student-infused streets of Byers Road, sits the splendour of Kelvin Grove. The park with its lush hills and mossy ponds, its ancient trees and cherubs perched on the lips of the fountains and its breathtaking gallery, where a far fiberglass Elvis and the Glasgow boys, Henry and Hornell, act as a support to Salvador Dali's interpretation of heavenly majesty. Where the local adjutants of his Christ offered mercy to the celebrity suicides and the well-heeled poisoners like Madeline Smith, the countless stolen souls upon whose scarred backs the square mile of murder was built weren't afforded the same courtesy. The cloak of the dear green place's respectability has always been mortaled in sanguine, hidden in plain sight. While Edinburgh has a history of torturing those it considers monsters, a cursory look at any West Coast tabloid will confirm that Glasgow chooses to venerate theirs. The Lord may judge, but this town doesn't. Though not its highest point, no other place in the city provides a vista so dramatic as the tarmac red brick ski jump from the edge of Partick Hill Bowling Club at Gardner Street. As the world watched, almost all of the curtains on the worked on block had been pulled back. Almost all. Thank you very much. And best of luck to Gillian tonight with Brody. Can't wait to read it. Take care.